We will now go to speakers in support, starting with David Leeds. Hi, uh, my name is David Leeds. I'm here on behalf of Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney. Uh, the Congresswoman, unfortunately, could not uh, be here today due to her business in Washington. Um, so I will be presenting her testimony on her behalf. I am pleased to thank the City Planning Commission for allowing me to present testimony today. I strongly support the East River 50s text amendment to the zoning resolution of the City of New York and ask that the CPC vote to uh, approve the proposed rezoning. The area of Manhattan Community District 6, east of 1st Avenue and north of East 51st Street, is the only area of Manhattan where R10 zoning, which allows buildings to have a floor area ratio of 10.0 or, or even 12.0 if certain allotments for affordable housing are met, applies on mid-blocks, which is to say narrow streets. This area is a low and mid-rise residential community, let, uh, yet current zoning law enables super tall buildings to be constructed with no regard for context or potential effects on the area. Recent advances in architectural technology have made it easier than ever thought possible to construct super tall buildings in excess of 700 feet tall. With the zoning regulations currently governing construction in the relevant area of CD6, there is nothing preventing an influx of soaring towers. These buildings either end up being apartment-sized bank accounts for wealthy absentee owners and private equity funds, or they create an influx of residents that overwhelm local infrastructure by overcrowding schools, transportation, and parks. Overdevelopment poses a threat to the character of this low mid-rise community as a result of its current R10 zoning. Supertalls block nearby residents' light and air, and they overshadow all low-rise buildings in the immediate vicinity. Additionally, it is inappropriate to allow huge towers to be built in the middle of residential narrow streets. Traditionally, taller buildings have been reserved for avenues, while mid-block buildings are lower in scale. The proposed text amendment to the zoning resolution, which draws inspiration from the city's tower on a base uh, development rules, would be far more suitable for the East River 50s area. The rezoning proposal would require that new buildings be constructed with at least 45% of their total floor area located in stories either partially or entirely below a height of 150 feet. This will prevent the kind of out of scale development that is possible under the current R10 zoning and block the construction of mid-block super talls. Uh, tower on base packing rules will also ensure the construction of buildings with appropriate heights and contextual street walls. In short, uh, the zoning regulations currently affecting the relevant area of CD6 include serious oversights that jeopardize the neighborhood's character. And uh, many of these oversights um, would be successfully remedied by the proposed text amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Questions for Mr. Leeds? Thank you. Thanks. Our next speaker in support is Robert Joseph. Hi, my name is Robert Joseph, and I'm a project manager at the Municipal Arts Society of New York. Over the past year, the Municipal Arts Society of New York has supported the East River 50s Alliance's rezoning proposal as an effective community-driven plan designed to prevent out-of-scale development and promote, uh, promote affordable housing in Sutton Place. The proposal was a practical model for local stakeholders seeking to rationalize zoning in their neighborhoods and maintain the character of their communities. While we were pleased with the proposal's affordable housing goals, we expressed concern that it didn't go far enough and urged the city to work with IRFA and the co-applicants to arrive at an even stronger affordability requirement. We commend the exhaustive effort IRFA, the Manhattan Borough President, uh, Council Member Ben Kilos and Dan Gorodnik and State Senator Liz Kruger have made in finding common ground with the city. And yet, Sudden Place, uh, the Sudden Place community is now faced with a rezoning text amendment that lacks the specific height restrictions and mandatory affordable housing component that would have best preserved the neighborhood character. While the current plan is certainly an improvement on the lack of protections under current zoning, we feel the current proposal falls short of the neighborhood's long-term vision. Equally concerning to MAS is the process that led to the proposal. It sends a message to other communities, especially those that do not have the same resources as Sutton Place, that grassroots community-based planning initiatives will be met with strong resistance by the city. The original IRFA proposal included reasonable height limits for, a future, for future construction, initially 260 feet, 
later increased to 350 feet. Allowed bonuses with a maximum of 13 FAR for residential uses with inclusionary housing and community facilities, and would have added 92 affordable housing units and 84,000 square feet of community facility uses. In contrast, the current proposal certified by CPC would, allow, would require all new residential buildings constructed in the rezoning area to conform to a tower on base provisions for our 10 districts and would maintain the FAR, 10 base, 2 bonus, and affordable housing requirements under current zoning. MAS is pleased that the new TOB regulations would impose limitations on a developer's ability to utilize air rights assembled through the use of zoning lot mergers on any particular site. And while the resulting building heights are expected to be taller than what was permitted under the original IRFA proposal, we recognize that they will be significantly shorter than what current zoning allows. We do, however, strongly urge the CPC to work with IRFA and the co-applicants to find a way to incorporate mandatory inclusionary housing component to the rezoning that would uh, better protect lower income residents of Sutton Place from potential displacement and include provisions for more community facilities space. The original IRFA proposal rep represented sound community planning measures which embody the concerns of people who live and work in Sutton Place. They created a blueprint for managing future development and framing critical land use decisions. The current proposal is a tentative step in the right direction for preserving neighborhood character. But given the effort and resources needed for the Sutton Place community to arrive at this level of compromise, we remain greatly concerned that lower income communities would not have the same capacity to wage such an effort. Throughout the re entire rezoning process, IRFA and the co-applicants worked in good faith with the Department of City Planning to meet the numerous strict requirements set by the city. While MAS is disappointed by many of the changes to IRFA's original proposal, we support the current iteration and urge the city to explore our recommendations regarding affordable housing and the inclusion of uh, community facilities. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Joseph. Questions, Commissioner Efron? Thank you. Uh, we heard Councilmember Kalos talk about um, other neighborhoods that don't have this protection, um, and the ones cited don't seem particularly under-resourced. Is there another neighborhood that you have in mind? Absolutely. We're thinking about Chinatown, which came up with their own rezoning plan, which has been shot down by the city repeatedly. Uh, is it about this aspect of a mid-block protection? No, it's about community planning in general. Okay. Other questions? Thank you. Uh, uh, uh. Uh, Mr. Joseph, th th thanks for coming, and I just want to um, say that I share the, the same concern you do or that MAS does about um, ensuring that community-based planning is put forward and is embraced and that um, communities that don't have the same level of resources may not be able to have the same level of hearing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Other questions? Thank you. Gail Haft. I'm Gail Haft. I live at 430 East 56th Street. Speak I live at 430 East 56th Street. I'm Gail Haft. I've lived in the Sutton area community for 15 years. I'm former president of the Sutton area community. Uh, thank you, uh, commissioners and chairman, for allowing me to speak today. Uh, I just want to uh, state that I am uh, very much in support of the rezoning proposal put forth by the East River 50s Alliance. I think it's an excellent solution, and it's the right thing to preserve our wonderful community. Thank you very much. Thank you. Questions from Ms. Haft? Thank you. Bonnie Barron? Bonnie Barron? Good afternoon to you, Commissioner Lago. Nice to see you again. Hello. Everybody can hear me? Is this on? Test. Hello. Civil rights and equal rights brought us all here, one way or the other. The fight for our rights. The right to self-determination with a voice and a vote. The rights of a community regardless of race, creed, color, or obvious color or not. <clears throat> My name is Bonnie Behrend. I'm a daughter of Huguenots, French Huguenots, who helped to found this country on religious freedom. 
I'm a daughter of the American Revolution, ancestors who fought in the American Revolution for the right for all of us to stand up here and speak independently about what's right for our communities and for ourselves, for self-determination. I'm a daughter of the Civil War, people who bled and died. Perhaps your ancestors did too for our rights to be here, for community and unity. And I'm Native American, which may not be immediately obvious. My ancestors, and perhaps your ancestors as well, bled and died for us to be here and to speak out about self-determination. Women, people of color, all of us who have been marginalized for far too long than we want to remember or count in a wretched history. But when we do reach this, this moment of power, what we need to do with it is the right thing. Rezoning is the right thing for the Sutton area community. I just don't think this one goes far enough. These are our homes we're talking about, a beautiful community of homes. A tower on a base is a trade-off. It's not the full answer. So I am opposed to the re rezoning and in favor of the rezoning. Do the right thing. Rezoning is the right thing. But I'm in favor of a townhome for a townhome, of nothing but townhomes in our home community. That's what's there. That's what gives us the sunlight and the walkability and the ability to talk to our neighbors and find out who they are. Nothing but townhomes is what I'm hoping for. So never lose faith in a righteous path toward freedom, justice, and opportunity in this great nation. These values are founding bedrock. These values continue to lead us forward, to compel us forward without fear, favor, doubt, or delay. Please do the right thing. Thank you very much. Questions for Ms. Barrett. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker in support is Corey Epstein. Hi, I'm Corey Epstein, and I work uh, for the Office of Councilmember Dan Gorodnik, who unfortunately can't be here, so I'm going to be reading his testimony. Good morning, Chair Lago and Commissioners. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Dan Gorodnik. I represent the 4th District of the New York City Council. My council district stretches from 14th to 98th Streets and includes a portion of the Sutton Place area. I am a co-applicant on the rezoning application that is the subject of today's hearing and very proud to be a part of this community-driven effort. This application aims to preserve the neighborhood feel of the area while allowing thoughtful contextual development. In the years that I have been working with the East River 50s Alliance on this rezoning effort, I have been extremely impressed with their thoughtful, comprehensive approach while, seek, while seeking to plan for the entire neighborhood, not just the site that first brought this issue to prominence. It is a committed professional group, and the Sutton Place area is lucky to have its advocacy. I also want to thank the Department of City Planning, which has engaged in continuous dialogue with us over the years and has put in an enormous amount of work to make this rezoning proposal a reality. As you know, this is the second application that we have submitted for this area. This application evolved from many conversations with the community and department, and I am confident that it represents a strong consensus position on the kind of development that is right for the area going forward. This application would impose a tower on a base rules for development on narrow streets, which would require at least 45% of the allowable bulk of any building to be under 150 feet. As a result, buildings would have to be much shorter than the current unadorned R10 zoning allows and with a more significant street wall for a better pedestrian experience. In all other residential neighborhoods in the city that are zoned R10, the city has imposed some kind of height limits or contextual protections. This is the only residential neighborhood where an R10 designation allows new buildings of unlimited height that do not respect the existing built fabric. Our previous application asked for precise height limits in the district as a means to protect the area. While the current application does not call for such limits, it nonetheless promotes the same goals and achieves similar aims. 
We need to protect the historic buildings, long-standing residents, and small businesses of this neighborhood so that they are not overwhelmed by the economic pressures that come with uncontrolled development rights. We believe that these controls can also contribute to ensuring that these new buildings creates housing for New Yorkers rather than just investment opportunities for global real estate investors. The, application, the applicable zoning laws need updating, and I am very pleased that the community has put in the time, effort, and resources to create a thoughtful plan for the future of this area. I urge you to vote in favor of this proposal. Thank you. Questions for Mr. Epstein? Thanks. And our next speaker in support is Jim Karras. Good morning, Chair Lago and Commissioners. I'm Jim Karras, General Counsel to Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer, here to speak in support of the application by IRFA, uh, which we are a co-applicant on together with uh, Councilmember Kalos, Councilmember Grodnick, and New York State Senator Liz Kruger. As one of the five sponsors, we urge the City Planning Commission to support and approve this text amendment. We believe this application represents an important step forward in providing greater protections for a residential neighborhood left without the tools it needs to compete with a growing desire for luxury towers throughout Manhattan. Sutton Place is unprotected because it is effectively the only residential neighborhood in New York City still subject to an R10 zoning designation without any contextual protections. Virtually all other R10 areas are either mapped R10A with contextual protections, protected by R10 infill regulations, as is the case with uh, Community Board 7, located in historic districts or are on wide streets and therefore subject to tower on a base regulations. This neighborhood's narrow mid-blocks make it vulnerable to, as of right, high-density R10 construction of very tall towers through zoning lot mergers. Such super talls were not contemplated in 1961 when R10 zoning was adopted. Unforeseen changes in construction techniques have propelled building heights upward, making these giant towers feasible on smaller footprints. In the case of the project area in this application, current rules would allow a super tall development that would exceed the typical neighborhood building height by a factor of more than four. The proposed development that brought the lack of protections for this neighborhood to our attention was originally slated to be more than 900 foot tall tower on 58th Street, a narrow street. This was a wake up call to a residential community in which, according to our EAS statement, all but eight buildings are less than 300 feet and all but one are less than 400 feet. So which, with much hard work and compromise on the part of the East River 50s Alliance and feedback from the Department of City Planning, the proposed text amendment would essentially apply modified tower and abase rules to the 10 tax blocks bounded by the East River and FDR Drive to the east, 59th Street to the north, 1st Avenue to the west, and 51st Street to the south. The accompanying packing, base, and setback rules would prevent unlimited lot mergers. This would prevent the development of super towers on these mid-blocks and encourage development that is at least not at extreme odds with the existing neighborhood context. Reasonable controls in residential areas are not without precedent in this part of Manhattan. If you review zoning sectional map 8D, there are numerous areas, mid-block portions in particular, that are R8B districts with a maximum building height of 75 feet. Some of these areas are significantly closer to East Midtown and less fully residential in character than this neighborhood. One concern that has been raised is the limited number of soft sites identified in the EAS. Most people who are familiar with our office's recommendations know that we have disagreed at times with the department's criteria for determining vulnerable sites. For instance, rent-stabilized buildings are often not included as vulnerable, despite decades of evidence to suggest that market forces make those housing units vulnerable to harassment and tenant turnover. Let me give you one example. In December 2015, our office, along with other local electeds, wrote to the department urging them to reconsider a proposal for a contextual rezoning of the University Place and Broadway corridors between 14th Street and East 8th Street. Mr. Uh, Harris, would you be able to submit the letter, the borough president's uh, letter? Yes. Uh, if Thank I could you. just have a couple sentences. I'm afraid we have a very packed house and we've been holding everyone okay. to that, but we can open it up to questions. Yes, Commissioner Abdees. Um Actually, you mentioned the soft site. I'm glad you, you mentioned that. Um, according to your analysis, then how many sites are you, you know, uh, effectively impacting um, through this? We've been told that, you know, the, this project or this uh, proposal will affect one site and therefore it's spot zoning. So what's your position on that? Well, I think, uh, I think the analysis that, which was done, you know, with the department, through the back and forth of the Department of City Planning, shows one site, but I think we, our position is that a lot of sites that wouldn't be considered 
uh, development sites or likely development sites actually could be development sites. Uh, and that's, those are the rent stabilized sites uh, or rent, what other? Rent stabilized, I mean in the uh, original uh, Bauhaus building there were reports that co-ops were actually negotiating to sell their buildings to, uh, to a developer. So we think there are more uh, possible development sites that are that are indicated. But you have not quantified. Uh, no. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you, Mr. Harris. Okay, thank you. Those are the end of the speakers who have signed up in support. So we'll now turn to speakers in opposition, beginning with Anthony Austin. Hello, Hi. Chair Logo, Vice Chairman Knuckles, and all supporting cast. <laughs> My name is Anthony Austin. We're all equals here, sir. We're <laughs> supporting cast. I'm a proud employer of Lindley's. I started working with Lindley's about five years ago. And working with Lindley's, I started from the bottom. It gave me the opportunity to work my way up in, into the company to become a foreman. I have built on 125th Street for Columbia University the first mine and brain buildings for all timers. I took pride in that work. I know we're here for the Sutton projects. I'm just letting y'all know how important working the construction workers are, you know. All right. I think we should go ahead with this project the Sutton Project, because it does a lot for the minority construction workers. We look forward to going to work. Me and myself, we take pride in our work. And if we go ahead and throw this away, it will be affecting so many families. I'm so proud. 17-year-old daughter, I told her I got a raise. I'm a foreman now. She's getting ready to go to college. I'm getting ready to fly down to Florida in June, buy her her first car, you know, being a graduation, it means a lot to me. I'm born and raised in New York City, born in the Bronx at Old Lincoln Hospital. We have a new Lincoln Hospital now. <laughs> okay, I am a native New Yorker. I have seen everything in New York, okay? I walked up and down 125th Street. They got up zoning out the gazoo going up. People trying to preserve their history in Harlem but people are zoning, they're knocking down buildings, doing, it, doing what they want to do. Down in Sutton, they're trying to do the same thing. I'm speaking on the behalf of minority construction workers, people that take pride in what they do. Lynn Lees gave me the opportunity to do this. Please, do not kick us out to the curb. Let us be productive Americans. Let us thrive. Let us keep working. We have a generation to build on. And we all got to remember, at one time, at one time in this world, we had to have a, a house built for ourselves. So let's not stop the generation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Austin. Questions? Thank you. Our next speaker in opposition is Eugene Travers. Good afternoon, Chair Lago and Commissioners. My name is Eugene Travers, and I'm going to be reading excerpts from a letter by Robert A. Knackle, Chairman, New York Investment Sales, Cushman & Wakefield Realty. I write to express my deep concern with this application. One of the aspects of New York City zoning resolution that provides tremendous benefits to both the development market and the city is the as-of-right nature of what is often a laborious, costly, and uncertain process of land entitlement. The approval of this application will erode the positive aspects of the city's beneficial as of right zoning framework and will have a chilling effect on development and economic growth within New York City. Further, approving this application will lead to reductions in land value, reductions in jobs, and reductions in tax revenue to the city. Every major real estate project requires a significant amount of money, often hundreds of millions of dollars. A decent amount of this investment is incurred early on in the development process as upfront acquisition costs even though a project may take years to bring to completion. Case in point, the development that this application has been designed to stop involves an assemblage, an assemblage consisting of 12 separate parcels and hundreds of millions in acquisition costs and financing. 
There are numerous other developments throughout the city that have cost more and taken longer to assemble. The capital markets are willing to underwrite these significant projects in large part based on the knowledge that, from a regulatory standpoint, the project is as of right and may proceed on the basis of a building permit alone. But when, as here, a small group of overwrought neighbors suddenly decides to revise the existing zoning specifically to thwart a particular development, then what is the point of having as a right zoning at all? Even site plan review, which at least has an established framework, would be preferable to this reactionary approach, which is nothing short of an ambush. It can only devolve into ad hoc negotiation and deal making at best, or no development whatsoever if left to fester. This ultimately leads to the broader question to be asked by developers' lenders. Why should I invest in New York City if there are other locations with a reasonably predictable land use framework that offers an acceptable level of risk? This application has the capacity to completely undermine our existing zoning framework, which developers and lenders rely on for a reasonable measure of predictability as to what can be built. The real estate industry simply cannot afford to take sought-for risks if local groups with special interests can spontaneously disregard this framework after significant investments of time and money have been made. The result would be that those significant investments of time and money would simply not be made. What I'm urging you to do today is to carefully examine the context in which this application is being made and then seriously consider the harm that its approval will have on the progress of our city. Thank you. Thank you. Questions for Mr. Travers? Yeah. Sorry, there's just a letter, but... <laughs> Our next speaker in opposition is Bavin Middleton. Uh, good morning, Chair Lago and Commissioners. Uh, my name is Gavin Middleton. I am a partner at Lair LLC. We're a development company uh, and manager, uh, founded and uh, headquartered in New York City. And we're presently working on projects as significant as Javits Center, Barnard College, Columbia University, Manhattanville campus, and Rockefeller University. We were hired by the client to manage the development of this project on their behalf. As you know, as of today, we have a new building permit. Uh, construction is well underway. We have completed excavations, and we are well advanced in foundations. I'm here today to request that you deny the proposed zoning text amendment that lies before you. My logic is simple. For decades, it has been understood that if you file a set of plans with the Department of Buildings that conform to the existing zoning regulations, and eventually, if you subsequently receive receive a full building permit, you have the confidence that your project can proceed. If this is no longer the case, I would suggest that our entire process to develop projects in New York City could be plunged into chaos. Please think very carefully about the decision that lies before you. My accent betrays the fact that I am not a product of New York. <laughs> However, I came here... We're proud of all accents in New York. <laughs> I came here in order to have an opportunity to contribute in a city that, in my opinion, delivers the finest buildings in the world. Why does it do that? Because of thoughtful zoning that yields a level of world-class architecture and resultant construction that all of us are proud of. It is my hope that thoughtful zoning continues to enable this reputation to be maintained. Thank you. Questions for Mr. Middleton? Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. Commissioner Delos. Commissioner Middleton, I, I appreciate you being here. Um, and uh, perhaps for at least my uh, information and perhaps for other members of the commission, at, um, at what level of foundation completion would you be vested? Uh, I'm not the legal expert, ma'am, so I'm just the, the person who has to get the work done. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you have a team on site now. Yes, I agree. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yes, Commissioner Levin. Um, and the building permit that you have, or permits, I'm sure is quite a bundle. How much does that allow you to do? Uh, it's a new building permit for the entire project. For the now. entire project? Yes. Okay, so all the, all the plans have been filed and... Correct. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you, Mr. Middleton. Thank you. Our next speaker in opposition, it was signed up Paul Finnamore, but he previously testified, signed up twice. Um, our next speaker in opposition is Richard Kulik. 
Oh, thank you. So our next speaker in opposition will be Stephen Ovid. I'm actually reading a letter from uh, my father, Jack Abbott, who wasn't able to be here. Um, dear Chief Lago, I reside at 426 East 58th Street, Unit 1B, which is located immediately west of the development that this rezoning intends to thwart. Um, I'm writing to express my serious concern with the negative impact that approval of the rezoning will have on my neighborhood. New developments tend to correlate with an increase in property values. The Sudden Place neighborhood has not seen any significant development in decades. Property values have remained stagnant and have not kept pace with other areas of the city. The addition of the new iconic tower uh, will breathe life into the areas and serve as a, as a beacon to promote the cachet of Sutton Place. Finally, if this application succeeds in preventing new development, uh, what will the community have gained? The only certain answer to that question is a massive construction pit an unsightly gap tooth in East 58th Street, perhaps for years. Instead of a public benefit, this application can only result in a public fight, or excuse me, a public blight. I strongly urge you to disapprove this ill-conceived application. Thank you for the letter, Mr. Ovid. I guess no question. Yes, Mr. Ovid? I guess we would like to question your father, you, but you, we'll, you, you, you and may not step. know the answer to this question, but is 426 East 58th one of the um, buildings that has sold its development rights to the developer here? Yes. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Ortiz. I mean, along those lines, I was wondering, could you point out the building? I presume it's one of those. It's the other one. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Great, thank you. Our next speaker in opposition is Michelle Escher. Uh, she's not here. Thanks for letting us know. Um, our next speaker in opposition is Bass Faki. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, we had Stephen Jacob signed up a second time, so we will then move on to Rafael Solari. He's outside of the phone, he's in the Thank you. Um, and then Ben Charles Fipen. Good morning to members of the Commission and the public. My name is Ben Carlos Typen, and I'm here as a member of More New York, an organization that's focused on making New York's housing more affordable by building a lot more of it and preserving what little affordable housing we have left. We oppose the proposed rezoning and urge the Commission to consider the following questions. Who is this for? The East River 50's Alliance touts the support of 37 buildings in and around the proposed rezoning area. Of those 37 buildings, 22, 59% of them, are co-op or condominium buildings, and 11 are mansions. Uh, meaning that 89% of the buildings supporting this proposal are wealthy homeowners. Furthermore, 20 of those buildings, 54% of them, uh, are taller than 150 feet. Those 20 buildings are among the largest by unit count supporting the proposal, meaning that 92% of the residential units supporting this proposal are in buildings taller than 150 feet, and therefore at risk of having their views obscured and their property values impacted. They're doubly hypocritical because many of the buildings uh, would not have been constructed as, a built, as built now if these proposed rules had been in place at the time. There's nothing grassroots about this proposal. This proposal has no interest in affordable housing and anything in their arguments to the contrary, merely serve as a poison pill to make development less likely. The second question is, who would this hurt? This proposal is anti-renter since so it severely limits the prospect of increasing the supply of housing in the proposed rezoning area. One of the objectives of this proposal is to limit the ability to transfer air rights. Uh, across sites on side streets within the proposed rezoning area. This could impact over 200,000 square feet of air rights, which could in turn turn into 500 units of housing or so. Uh, even if none of those uh, are built, and this proposal is still anti-renter because of the bulk rules uh, limiting the effectiveness of cross subdivision of uh, high floor units to affordable housing. Rents are high in the proposed rezoning area because people want to live there. This proposal will displace demand to more vulnerable neighborhoods. One of the previous speakers claimed that this proposal will make it less likely that rent-stabilized tenants will be displaced 
but in fact it will create an incentive for building owners to displace those tenants since they would no longer have the option of transferring their air rights off-site. Anyone who wants to live in the proposed rezoning area but cannot afford to will now be forced to move north in search of affordability along their commuting path. What would have been set in place renters now will now become East Harlem and South Bronx gentrifiers. You may be rationalizing this uh, by saying, you know, these sites, the few soft sites that remains would be difficult to assemble, so uh, making this a little bit more difficult wouldn't really make much of a difference. First, any housing delayed is housing denied. Second, even if this proposal didn't end up stopping any units from being produced, I urge the commission to ask itself, what message does this send to the rest of the city? If the powers that be capitulate on this proposal, it would be a slap in the face to the people of East Harlem specifically, who have gotten very few concessions from a discretionary process, while the, the disapproval process right now is discretionary, this proposal didn't emanate from a EULA for a discretionary process. Uh, the East River 50s Alliance has absolutely no leverage in the situation aside from their wealth and currying favor with their own politicians. Approving this proposal would tell every neighborhood fearing gentrification that the city does not care about them, and it would provide a blueprint for every other rich neighborhood to downzone their way into becoming even more segregated and inequitable, and inequitable than they already are. Thank you, Mr. Typen. Questions? Yes, Commissioner Delos. I would just ask you to um, submit the balance of your testimony. Yeah. It, was, it was one line. It was just oh. saying, <laughs> if you believe in ending the, two, uh, the tale of two cities that the mayor ran on, reject this proposal. Yes, Commissioner Ortiz. Um, uh, what I find interesting about this proposal, and I'm, I'm wondering what you think, is the fact that um, you know we have uh, our public officials um, who have come out <coughs> in support and our co-applicants which is a little different than, than some of the other um, uh, proposals we've seen before us and, and suggestive to me of, um, you know, real, uh, albeit I understand your concerns about, uh, you know, the, the nonprofit group that is also a co-applicant, but, um, you know, that there's a public engagement and there is a public interest here, so could could you speak to that? Because I think that is a substantive difference in this application over. Sure. Um, I don't know how much time you've spent in Community Board Six and uh, in the meetings, you know, preceding this this particular uh, uh, meeting. This is not a grassroots, you know, proposal. The the people who have been involved in this process represent, you know, these larger buildings. But there are many more people in this neighborhood who are, you know, not attending these meetings either because they have jobs, they can't get childcare, whatever it is. So the people who have been influencing this process are uh, well-heeled, landed gentry that have free time. And there's no opposition or organized opposition to their proposal um, for a whole host of reasons. So if you're an uh, elected official, you say, why not? Uh, these are the only people complaining about this. And maybe it wins, maybe it doesn't. Either way, I lose by not supporting this and I win by supporting this. So I, I can't speak to the actual motives of the politicians, but I suspect that uh, they didn't see, they didn't feel like they had a choice uh, as, as this process uh, emanated from the not-for-profit group, and that not particular not-for-profit group is um, made up of some of the loudest and uh, most well-resourced constituents within their district. Imagine our public officials might not feel the same way, but... <laughs> they might not admit it in public. Other questions? <laughs> Our next, then, thank you, Mr. Typen. Um, our next speaker in opposition is Stephen Smith. Hello. Uh, my name is Stephen Smith. I'm also with uh, More New York. Uh, I work in real estate, but uh, unlike the uh, co-op owners in the Sovereign or, you know, Gamma, I have no financial stake in the project. Um, I suspect this rezoning is mostly symbolic. Uh, the developer will probably get a variance, continue the foundation work, and will vest the site under the old rules. Hopefully they'll finish it before the market cycle uh, ends, and then the rezoning will essentially be dead letter. I don't really think there's any other receiving sites. Um, nevertheless, uh, symbolism matters. Uh, the de Blasio administration signaled early on that they weren't going to trade down zonings for up zonings the way that Bloomberg did. You know, the wealthy interior of Park Slope got a down zoning, Fourth Avenue got, you know, the mixed area in Fourth Avenue got an up zoning. Uh, the wealthy single-family neighborhoods around Jamaica got a downzoning. You know, the more diverse downtown got an upzoning. Um, anyway, uh, up until now, the administration has held fast to that, uh, but I'm worried that, this, that with this deal, uh, they're going to send a signal that they're willing to do it again. Uh, Andrew Berman has been an agitating to downzone the last few development sites in the village below 14th Street. 
And uh, pretty soon, Jumani Williams is going to come to you and ask for a downzoning of the detached homes uh, east of Brooklyn College in the R6 area. Um, you know, how can you tell East Flatbush that they have to accept apartment buildings in their neighborhood when Sutton Place, you know, which already has this massive sovereign tower, sovereign, the, the sovereign, this tower of the sovereign, uh, isn't, you know, won't accept anything larger than that. The Sutton Place rezoning may, uh, I hope, not change any facts on the ground, uh, but East Flatbush and the Broadway quarter below 14th Street will be much more consequential requests. There's probably about, you know, one to two million square feet in net uh, development potential around Brooklyn College, and, you know, who knows how much there is in the village. So I'm asking you to stick to your guns. Don't set the precedent. Thank you. Questions for Mr. Smith. Thank you. Our next speaker in opposition is John Elugi. Um, hi, I'm reading a letter for Peter Pritchard. Uh, dear Chair Lago, I am, I am a board member and resident of the 42-unit cooperative apartment building located at 447 East 57th Street. Our building is located south of the residential building that is under construction at 430 East 58th Street. Our building writes in opposition to the proposed zoning for a number of reasons. First, it is not clear to us what the proposed rezoning is. It is my understanding that City Planning Commission presented the application and sent it to the Community Board only two weeks ago. Typically, the Community Board then holds a public hearing for the local community. But Community Board 6 and the Borough President waived the rights to hold a hearing. This is patently unfair. This application will affect our homes and our investments. For some of us, our home is our sole investment. We deserve to have the applicant present we deserve to have the applicant present the application to the local residents in our community and at a time when residents are able to attend. It is well known that certain influential members of the community have influenced the decision making of the community board, all in the name of stopping the development at 430 East 58th Street in order to protect their views. It is alarming that their power has influence to the community board and our elected officials to such a degree. We urge city planning uh, to avoid being dragged into this backroom deal and continue public hearings to a future date to allow us to review the application and how it will affect our community. Sincerely, Peter Pritchard. Thank you. Questions? Thank you. Thank you. So that is the last person who has signed up to speak. I would now ask if there is anyone present in the audience who would like to be heard. Yes, Mr. Horner. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair Lago, members of the Commission. Um, my name is Sandy Hornick. I'm a uh, planning consultant uh, working with uh, IRFA. Uh, I'm from Brooklyn. I'm not from uh, Manhattan. Uh, but where I live in Brooklyn, uh, the zoning is higher on the wide streets with higher FARs and higher height limits and lower on the narrow streets where the FARs are lower. Um, what this community has uh, asked for is the same thing that the city has done. They have not asked for a down zoning. They have not asked for any change, lowering of the FAR. In fact, in our discussions, this community would have accepted a higher FAR if state law would have permitted a higher FAR. So this is not a community seeking uh, a down zoning. Um, reference was made, I, from what I could hear outside, to uh, uh, East Harlem. In East Harlem, in the mid-blocks, on the narrow streets, the FARs that are being proposed are 3 and 5.6. Some of the wide streets are being proposed at 12. We have 12 now. We are stay, proposing to stay at 12. Questions have been asked about other areas and, uh, um, you know, other, other areas. And I, you know, the truth is that in other areas, there are one or more zoning regulations or historic district regulations that control uh, height or, or require review uh, on the narrow streets, and whether that's R10 infill, R10A, uh, historic district uh, uh, designations, and so on. So it's not that there are no other places zoned R10. It's that other places that are zoned R10 as compared to commercial districts um, uh, have this... Uh, uh, this is the only neighborhood 
with unrestricted height that it is residentially zoned and permits or attend. Um, there was a statement that somehow, um, if, if this only goes through, that a vacant site will remain vacant somehow indefinitely. Um, and uh, in my 40 years of experience, uh, I can think of no place where an achievable footprint FAR of 15 to 18 uh, has remained on a vacant cleared site indefinitely. I just, I, I, I find that hard uh, to see the precedent of that happening um, elsewhere. Um, there are questions about tall buildings and short buildings casting shadow. Actually, they cast physically the exact same amount of shadow. Uh, it has to do with the width of the shadow and the speed of the shadow, but they cast exactly the same amount of shadow. A tall, thin <laughs> building casts a very long shadow that covers more properties. A shorter building covers a, casts a shorter shadow. I guess I'm done. Thank you, Mr. Hornet. Questions? Commissioner Levin. Yeah. You're not off the hook. You, you're not off the hook. You're, yeah, don't, <laughs> don't go away. Oh, okay. Don't go away. You're, you're, you're the man who knows a thing or two about contextual zoning around here. <laughs> Um, um, so if you put together, we heard um, testimony from Adam Lubinsky, um, and he's submitted materials that I hope will make their way to you as well. But they demonstrate a very strong high street wall context here. In the, that's much higher the kind of street wall we would get with tower and base rules. Um, and then immediately following, we heard from Mr. Jacobs about um, the creation of the tower and base rules designed really to match the um, situation on the Upper East Side where you had rows of tenement buildings with towers being stuck in between and you wanted a 85 foot base in order to match that context. And I think both of them were making the case that um, neither, uh, that the current proposal um, will have the effect, uh, well, they didn't go ahead and said this, but this current proposal would be out of context for this area, that we need to give a closer, even, even if we were in the situation where we wanted to uh, limit building heights, this uh, is going to create another anomalous situation that people might not be happy with. The short answer to that is, of course, that 800 feet is the thing that is not like anything in the neighborhood. 800 feet is 300 and some odd feet taller than the tallest building I'll give you that. Uh, in the neighborhood. Um, I don't actually agree with the, I mean, the description they talk about, which I think, you know, we did our, a look at that, and uh, it's not the number of buildings, it's the frontage that, because if you use the number of buildings, you wind up with 90-something percent being fitting into an R10A envelope, because small little buildings count for more than big, big buildings. All right, um, and uh, uh, it is absolutely true that by most of the standards in which most of the contextual zonings were redone, which use thresholds of 60 and 70 percent compliance, we would comply at an R10A. Um, mm -hmm. The department uh, consistently felt that, that in spite of that, the presence of a number of taller <laughs> buildings which are generally between 300 and 360. There's one, uh, the Sovereign, which is uh, just under 500. Uh, overweighed the preponderance of those buildings and that, that those height limits would be too tall. So, um, uh, would be too, would be too, be too short. Yeah, yeah sorry. Um, and uh, that's the community who thinks they're probably too tall. Uh, so, you know, we looked at, I come finally up with a tower on the base regulation, which by the way is slightly more liberal than the wide street tower on the base regulation. And it's more liberal, it has the same lot coverage requirements, but it has a lower packing requirement. Mm. The tower on the base has two rules. Um, the 85 foot street wall is not the most important rule in tower on the base. It's the tower coverage, which at the end of the day controls how much FAR you can scoop up um, uh, and, and, and pile up on the site. And a packing requirement which requires a certain percentage of the floor area be below a height of 100 and a, f a floor that's at least partially below 150 feet, let's just say 155 mm -hmm. feet uh, be below that level. So our packing, proposed packing requirement is actually 5% lower 
than the packing requirement in the existing R10 uh, uh, wide street condition. So it's actually a bit more liberal, and that is actually to give a little bit more flexibility in terms of how much floor area can be merged onto a single uh, lot. So it's not more restrictive, it's actually more liberal. Are there other soft sites in this rezoning area? So, well, clearly there's this soft site. Right. Um, and let's uh, talk a little bit about, about uh, what soft site there is. CEQA has soft site criteria. Right. I'm not talking and about so those. And so we are, okay. we are bound by, by that. There are others, there is at least another site that we might think is soft, but CEQA does not consider soft. So I'm not even going to uh, uh, mention it. Um, but, but yes, we believe that there, there, is a, there is precedent here. First of all, this site, the whole site that we're talking about, would not meet, if this were not a developed site and somebody said this was a soft site under secret, it would not meet the secret soft site criteria. Um, except that, of course, somebody has assembled it and cleared a piece of it and, and made it actually a soft site. We believe that... that Wait, you with, mean the buildings that were there with the buildings you know, that were if, there before? If, 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 there was no proposal for a building here. And we came in and said, well, somebody assembled 12 sites and scoop up all the developments, put it on these three things. Secret, Secret would, would dismiss that. All right? Um, so uh, on, in this case, you know, two things happened. One is uh, some of the development rights, of some of the underbuilt lots would be used on the footprint site that is now cleared. Right? And presumably... Uh, with the same amount of cantilever, although we have seen even in the course of these discussions the amount of cantilever has changed as people have gone back and renegotiated what they could do. So originally it was a 10-foot cantilever on one side, and then it became a 10-foot cantilever on one side and a 15 or 16-foot cantilever on the other side. And, and it speaks to the underlying value of these development rights, which is they, they create a value that, that that calls out for the marketplace to find a way to use them. We believe that over time, other pieces of this assemblage will become available and that another building will be built. And in fact, you know, one of the criticisms that I heard when I was standing out there, it's very hard to hear out there. I know you're moving, you're going to have a better place, but uh, uh, it was better when the TV was out there. At least you could see what people were saying. Could you take the microphone with you? Could you take the microphone with you? This is Thanks. Yeah. One of the criticisms is this creates a more of a wall, and the other criticism is this isn't going to happen. Both of those things are not true. All right? And, and the criticism that, that it creates a wall is because, of course, it could happen. And so we believe, and that is what's in the reasonable worst case uh, development scenario, is that another site will be assembled, it's not as much to acquire it because the development might are already of it owned by for development, and only the underlying sites need to be acquired, which are now much less expensive than they would be if you had to buy the full package of development rights. Um, and the other thing about Secret is it's not a prediction of what will happen. It's an analysis of what might reasonably happen, and we think that this easily meets those conditions. Other questions? Commissioner Ortiz. Hi, Cindy. Um, two things. Um, one uh, issue that I'm sympathetic to is that these guys follow the rules as they were written, whether we like it or not. Um, and I think, you know, that's, that's a challenge. Um, and and perhaps there's a, a remedy, you know, through um, you know a, a Department of Buildings, um, which I, I don't know. But what what is your group's position on that? Because and and if this is the only site, and we've heard, you know, and I hear you saying that maybe this isn't the only soft site, maybe it is, you know. But if this is the only site where. Um, this would have a significant impact, um, and you know they might be able to uh, claim hardship. Then what are we doing here? Okay, so so, in, first of all, people are right. They they rely on on what the rules are, and they move forward. 
But if that were the case, we could ne the city could never do rezonings because all rezonings are changing so someone's plans somewhere, right? But well, we give people an opportunity. We give people an opportunity. So, so from the community's the point of view, community has been involved in this very publicly for two years. There has been press coverage that they were looking uh, 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 to do this. Um, there have been presentations to the community board going back, uh, I believe, more than a year. Uh, more, than, more than several times, we presented different versions uh, of this. As our, you know, we come up with an idea. We would go to city planning. They would tell us, "Don't ever come back again." We would come back again. They never said that. So. <laughs> <laughs> Metaphorical. Um, and um, uh, um, so this has all been very, very public for a very, very long time. And, uh, um, you know, I am reminded when, when Midtown was, uh, uh, East Mid when Midtown rezoning was done in 1982, there were many, many speakers who spoke and said, oh, no, this is going to kill my project and so on and so forth. And... Uh, it was ultimately adopted, and some of those projects vested, and some of those projects went to the board to seek additional time to vest, and some of them were unable to vest. That's, that is the process. The process is not, well, you started, therefore you're done, and you're done. The process is if you finish foundations, you're entitled to vest, and you have a building permit, you're entitled to vest. If you've started foundations, then the board will make a determination as to whether what you have done qualifies you to vest, and I have no idea what, or what, how much they've done, and wouldn't be qualified to judge it anyway. All right? Um, and, uh, uh, but, you know, there is a process for that. So I, n no one is asking for something that is out of the ordinary here. We're asking for something we spent two years in the process, and we're asking for something that is very much in accord with the, with the rules. So if I understand you correctly, um, we may go ahead with this process and we may get this building. That's absolutely correct. Isn't it, you know, I, and other, the, <laughs> other questions? <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Hornick. Um, we have some more speakers now signed up and um, speaking in favor, Rachel Honig. And we are now squarely good afternoon. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for giving us this opportunity today. In 2003, I bought my very first home. Maybe some of you can remember the pride that you felt when you bought your very first home. My first home was actually at the corner of 59th and 1st at 400 East 59th Street. In 2005, I got divorced. And I still decided to live four blocks from 400 East 59th Street, now at 60 Sutton Place South. So for any of you who might have also weathered that in your life, the idea that a neighborhood is so important to you that you only move five blocks away from your ex-husband, you understand what a kind of a special place <laughs> Sutton Place is. That's um, a unique land use perspective that I'm not sure we've heard before. <laughs> right. Um, this is an incredibly special neighborhood. I now own my second apartment at 60 Sutton Place South, in fact, on the opposite end of this district of the East River 50s Alliance talking about. The first one was the northwest corner. Now I live at the southeast corner. Um, so this is an issue that really addresses all of us. Um, we heard a challenge to bring 2,000 pe 2, people to the table. I, I can actually give you one better. This is an issue that has actually spurred me to run for the city council, and I am currently a candidate for City Council District 4 to hold Dan Grodnick's seat. That is how important this issue has essentially become a cornerstone in real estate parlance of my campaign and how important it is to see that a community, regardless of wealth, regardless of demographic, has the right and has come together with a meaningful plan and a meaningful proposal of their wishes. That is essentially what city government should do. Um, and I think that the, the commission should take that in tremendous advisory. Um, as a resident though, but going back to my resident, um, in the last 10 years, and I'd urge you to go back to the New York Times real estate section, which I'm sure you all read religiously, the New York Times has actually almost warned residents against Sutton Place because of its soft, quiet, off the beaten path neighborhood feel. 
Um, and that really is what it is. So I urge you to come with me and walk the finger parks with my rescue dog and I, and to come and shop the fishmonger and the butcher and the cheese shop that still live just off the, the area we're talking about on First Avenue and understand what a small business and neighborhood community this is. Um, and lastly, the one thing that people haven't really been addressing here today is this is our waterfront. This is the edge of our island. We live on an island. And if we set a precedent today um, where we essentially have tall, super talls potentially bordering our entire island, we essentially build the wall we're all not trying to build here in our country, but we do it instead for our island. So I urge you strongly to support the proposal before you today. Questions for Ms. Honig. Thank you. Thank you. We now have another speaker signed up in opposition, John Calico. Chair Lago, members of the Planning Commission, my name is John Calico. I am president of Gamma and the developer of this project. I just wanted to bullet point some things to clarify statements that have been made earlier. Um, the last speaker in favor said this was a two-year process. Yes, there was a two-year process going on essentially to spot zone us out, and they put in an application that had a height restriction that uh, uh, Chair Lago commented on in the June hearing as something that really wasn't viable. Um, it wasn't until very recently that we were even made aware of this new iteration of the application. And in this new iteration of the application, it's extremely clear that there is no public good being addressed and there is no public uh, housing, affordable housing criteria. The cloak of that in the first application has herefore been removed. We've actually spent quite a bit of money to acquire affordable housing inclusionary rights for this project. In the event that this didn't go forward, our project, it would only make sense depending on the price, that we would sell those back in the market, therefore depriving uh, affordable housing to be built had we been able to use those certificates ourselves. Um, the politicians, the four politicians on this application, especially uh, um, in Hattonburg, President Brewer, have come out and said that they believe in more transparent, slow, diligent, thoughtful process, as was the case with Midtown East. Here it seems to be the exact opposite, just a rush. While I do not believe this rezoning should happen, I'm not denying that rezonings in the city are an important part of development. But those rezonings should always be after careful, thoughtful debate. And even here, we've had two speakers in favor of this proposal, both quiver as to whether they really were because they wanted an affordable housing part that wasn't included in this IRFA uh, application. So it, it, it seems that even those in favor not quite coordinated. Um, a couple, addressing a couple other earlier points, we have never met with a rent regulated or rent controlled tenant. Not once, not ever in this entire project. It's been stated that it's happened. We have never ever done it, not once. Um, the project is masked as is. The building has been designed, as, as was told previously, so purchasing surrounding buildings is not something we're looking to do. Reference was made to, a prior, to the prior owner trying to build, buy out a condo, a uh, co-op building to, to the east. That is true, but the financial cost of that was about 10 times the value that would have made sense. So even he was unable to do it. Thank you, Mr. Calico. Questions? Yes, Commissioner Levin. Um, yes, Mr. Calico, it's actually not directly relevant to the subject of this hearing, but since you raised the question of affordable housing, um, you're using the, you proposed to use the inclusionary housing bonus on this project? Yes, we purchased about $25 million worth of inclusionary housing certificates from a project that was built on 39th Street uh, in uh, District 6. 39th and do you know where it is? It's 3rd and Lex. Right okay. And how, do you happen to know how many units were produced as a result? 
Um, I, I don't have the exact count. Well, they're under back construction, there. presumably. No, no, it's finished. They're, they're, it's, it's actually finished. been finished. It's, I believe it's in the low 20s. I can get you the exact number. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Marin. Mr. Calico, good morning. Thank you. Good, good afternoon. Morning. Thank you for being here. Um, there were a couple of questions surrounding the, the configuration of the, exist, of, the, of the three buildings, that, of the buildings that were there. And, you know, we're trying to ascertain the number of buildings and the number of units in each building. Can you tell us what those were? There were three buildings, 428, 430, and 432 East 58th Street. In terms of the number of units, I can get back to you with that information. When we made the loan to the purchaser of those buildings, those buildings were vacant. Um, so I can't speak to what happened to those tenants, whether they were free market or not. It, it was before our... So you wouldn't, I, was, I would assume you wouldn't know if they were rent stabilized at the time. I, I will tell you, I do believe that a handful, my guess would be around six, were rent stabilized. I can get you the exact numbers. Again, it was, it was before we got involved, but I think I do have that information. I would appreciate that. Thank you. Commissioner Arfon. I'm almost reluctant to ask this because it's really not a referendum on your building. We're really talking about um, uh, a, a zoning question for a larger area. But since you're there, um, you, your land use lawyer referred to you as the lender on a previous developer. And less important to me about when you took title to the buildings is really when the borrower went into default and in trying to figure out the timing of the uh, community action versus yours. Do you recall when they went into yes. default? Yes. So the borrower defaulted January of 2016. The borrower subsequently filed for bankruptcy, and we weren't able to purchase the property until March of 17. During the term of our loan and the subsequent bankruptcy, because of our position as lender, we were not able to do anything that an owner of the property would except that we did petition the bankruptcy court to enable us to demolish the three buildings that were partially demolished and then, and then left. So luckily, we were granted permission to do that, and we removed the blight that was in that area. OK, thanks. Other questions? Commissioner Delos. Uh, Mr. Calico, I, I appreciate you stepping forward to, to speak up. Um, it, it sounded as the end of your testimony that you were um, perhaps describing other potential soft sites. Um, you, were, you, you seem to be going through the example of prior, another owner, um, you know, looking to purchase condo units that, that didn't work out. Are you aware of any others? Uh, no. What, what I was meaning to explain was certainly any privately owned property can be purchased theoretically. However, even in this situation with the uh, co-op, that had 42 tenants, getting them all to agree to something uh, was extremely difficult. And when you had even one or two holdouts, it would reprice the entire mass. So doing something like uh, purchasing a, a fully occupied co-op is near impossible. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, Commissioner Ortiz. Um, Again, I'm not sure if you're the right person to answer this, but have you looked into vesting and what, whether that's a likelihood in this situation? Um, I, I can tell you that we will not be finished with the foundation should the vote at city council occur and pass this rezoning in around Thanksgiving. We will not be finished then. Um, whether we are vested under the BSA requirements, I, I don't know. Um, certainly, it seems like I've, we've met some of that criteria, but it's, it's not something that I'm certain of yet. When will foundations be done? About 8 to 12 weeks. Thank you. Other questions from Mr. Calico? Thank you. Thank you. So for the second time, we have reached the end of folks who have signed up to speak. But if there is anyone in the audience who would like to, please raise your hand now. OK. Um, if not, I will state the obvious, which is that this commission will look at the application from a land use perspective for the area-wide proposal. Um, there is not 
an EIS in this matter. It wasn't required, so the record doesn't remain open for a set amount of time, but the Planning Commission will gladly accept written testimony for another week. And so with that, the public hearing on this matter is closed. Madam Secretary, any other business before the Commission? No, Madam Chair. Then the meeting is ended. Thanks.